presence here today? <laughs> so glad you're all here. Thank you so much for coming out to join in with us today. As we offer up our worship on the Lord today, we are grateful for your presence. You know, when I stand up here, I just hate to interrupt the great fellowship that's going on. The only thing I can do about that is encourage you to come 30 minutes earlier. <laughs> and then you will have lots of time to fellowship. We're so grateful that you are here. Uh, thank you for coming out and joining in with us on this beautiful Lord's Day that we've been blessed with. Uh, we realize the great responsibility that we have as God's people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we are very, very thankful for our visitors today. We want you to know that you're an honored guest. No matter where you're from, we're glad that you're here. We invite you to come back at every chance that you have. We do have a few things by way of announcement before we get started in our worship. First of all, we have a rather extensive sick list. We want to keep these folks in our prayers. My friend Susie Kirby uh, from Fort Payne, who uh, is getting over a second knee replacement surgery as well as a uh, systemic infection from staph. So we want to keep her in our prayers. Also, Brother Demar Elam, who continues to get over his uh, recent back surgery. Sister Ann Boswell, who continues to battle with medical issues, as well as Mr. Jackie Blaylock, who is uh, in the hospital needing a heart. Uh, the last I heard, he was taken off of the transplant list because he had so many other health problems that were trying to get in under control. And so we certainly want to keep Mr. Blaylock and his wife in our prayers and the doctors and all that are working on him as well. Uh, there is a newsletter in the back that has a lot of these uh, folks listed, so please pick one of those up on the way out if you didn't get one on the way in. Uh, I've got to hear pray for all of our missionaries on foreign fields. You know, it's a difficult time for them right now uh, with the pandemic and the, uh, the problems that they're facing because of that, so continue to remember them. Also. Sister Mary Lyon out in Texas was in ICU for her heart. Uh, she continues there. We want to pray for her and pray for the doctors that are dealing with her. Uh, also, Sister Isabel Bailey from the Cartersville congregation, uh, they discovered an aneurysm in her and repaired that surgically. Uh, she is doing better and may get to go home today and certainly is thankful for our prayers, but we want to pray for uh, Sister Isabel Bailey. Uh, also, don't forget about our graduate reception tonight. The uh, senior Bible presentation will be right after the uh, closing prayer here in the auditorium, and then we'll move to the annex for the reception. There will also be the tent out there uh, so that we can just go in a few at a time and celebrate our graduates. Also, Morgan Sutton's wedding is coming up on May 22nd at the Calhoun Church at 4 p.m., and we also got an announcement about Skyler's graduation that we'll put on the bulletin board as well. I think that that's all that I have right now. If you have other things that you'd like to have announced, if you'll let me know, I'll be happy to do that at the appropriate time. But now we'll turn it over to our song leader. Number 676. 676. Jesus. 
This morning will be taken from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. It's John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. We're reading from a New King James. <clears throat> I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. 
You're already, you are already clean because of the world which I have spoken to you, because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Let us pray together. Our Holy Father, as we approach your throne of grace and mercy this morning, we pray, Father, that our hearts and minds are completely focused upon your heavenly realm, and that in our mind's eye and heart that we can see you upon your throne with our Lord and Savior Jesus there with you. And Father, we ask for many things in our prayers these days, but most of all, Father, we are thankful that we have the opportunity to be here as you have commanded us to come together and worship you. We pray, Father, that our worship is pleasing to you and ask you to come here and continue to give us the mercy and love that you've shown that allows us to be here. That each and every individual and leader of family here, mothers and fathers, and that the little children also, that they listen intently to your word and your will, and that we will stay close to it in each and every moment in our lives. We thank you, Father, for all the gifts that you've given us, the gifts that we're about to give a portion of back to you, all the things that you bless us with each and every day that we take for granted. May we be mindful of it now as we worship you, Father. There are so many mentioned sick, Lord. Susie Kirby, Demar Elam, Kay Ann Boswell, Jackie Blaylock, Mary Lyon, Isabel Bailey, and many more, Father, that are listed. And Father, we ask that you be with them and that they can have a comfort of life and have some peace. And if it be thy will, Father, that it can heal completely but that they can have the moment of peace and comfort away from their illnesses. And again, to be made whole if it's thy will. We pray for those who are studying and working hard to continue the spreading of your word that are in the mission fields, that are in the education systems of the Lord, that they will learn the scriptures and pray, Father, that you give them wisdom and give their family strength as they support them as you've given our leaders here strength and their family strength to support Tim and our minister also and his family as they work diligently here each and every day to bring us the word, to bring us the examples in our lives so that we will be led to what you will give us a reward in heaven when this life is over. Those that are entering matrimony fallen, we pray that they were building themselves up spiritually for we believe that it is a till death to us part a husband and a wife and also the beginning of a, a new family and a new family in Christ be with all of us Father as we continue to worship and pray and sing these songs of joy and edification to one another and help us to build each other up especially when we fall. When we have a problem that we're there for each other and looking out for one another. Again, Father, thank you for all the blessings that you give us each and every moment of the day and especially the moment, the moments in this hour where we worship you and give our hearts and minds totally to you. It's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. our minds for the Lord's Supper, number 645. 645.
John 3, 16, probably the most well-known <coughs> Bible verse, I would say, in the world. Uh, religious, probably even non-religious people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For most in the, in the world, in the religious world, this speaks mainly to, to God's love. And that is very true. Uh, no, no getting around that. But the second part of that, that verse is probably overlooked to some extent. And that he, he says that uh, he gave him so that we would not perish. Uh, for me, this speaks to, to uh, not only God's love, but God's justice as well. Uh, for those of you who, who may have done a lot of reading, I'm sure most, most of us have, uh, in the books of uh, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, books like that, um, see the, the extent that the children of Israel had to go, to, go through, uh, through sacrifices and feasts, and, and uh, a whole tribe of Levi was dedicated to just that one purpose. It's through sacrifice and through lambs, bulls, uh, goats, uh, even doves and grain offerings. And the point I'm trying to get to here is uh, how beautiful it is. The sacrifice of Jesus uh, took all of, all of that out of the way. Uh, scriptures tell us that uh, that was nailed to the cross. Um, and how beautiful it is that uh, it took the it took the, the willing sacrifice of God's Son to make that possible. And uh, we can, when we think about that, we can see the power, uh, the power of that, of that sacrifice, the power of His blood and His sacrifice did for us as Christians. And uh, I don't know about you, but what a wonderful thing it is that we don't have to, we don't have to do the things that the children of Israel did. And we can, as we think about, as we gather around the table uh, and take of the emblems in a moment, we think about not only what he went through on the cross, but all the wonderful blessings and all the wonderful things uh, that that sacrifice did uh, for us, uh, bring us back to God, the redeeming power that it had, and giving us access to be able to come to God as we pray. And... Uh, Obviously, as this verse says, if we believe and, and obey, then uh, we, will, we will not perish, but have everlasting life. We bow to give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to together as, as your people and to look back to the cross and remember what your son did for us. We ask you to bless this bread that represents his body. We ask you to bless all of us who take that we'll do this in a manner of pleasing you that we'll, we'll remember that sacrifice and, and all the many wonderful things that it that it does for us. We ask you to be with us as we do this. In Jesus' name we pray. this morning we we thank you for the blood of your son that the river that uh, had the ability to, to wash away our sins we ask you to be with us as we we take this cup and as we remember the blood that was shed there and the power that it has that you'll be with us we continue this morning that we'll do this in a man pleasing you in jesus name we pray
concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, we would normally be uh, getting back, uh, passing the, uh, uh, the trays. Uh, if you uh, did not have the opportunity to, uh, to give as you came in, the, the trays on the back, uh, if you want to uh, make your contributions we, as you leave, uh, if you'll bow with us, we'll give thanks for that. Father, we thank you for, for all you give us. We thank you for our lives, our health, our, our jobs, that uh, we, we can earn a living. We pray that you'll be able to give back to you. We'll do so cheerfully and, uh, and in the proper way. And we ask you to be with the church here, the, the leadership, that uh, these funds will be used by your kingdom and be used in, in the proper way. Uh, we pray for all the works that are, that are done by the congregation here that you will you will bless them all. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> you would mark in your books the invitation song number 29. Number 29 will be the song of invitation. Before the lesson number 833. 833. There's a message to invite for the sinful and the sad. Bring it out.
certainly is a beautiful Lord's Day today, and we're glad that you are here. Isn't it wonderful to live where we live? Uh, you know, our, we have an anniversary coming up again for, uh, this will be eight years that we have labored here with this congregation. I just want to let you know how grateful I am, uh, me and my family are, for uh, each of you and the wonderful way that we've been enfolded here into this congregation. Uh, we feel like family. Uh, it is important where you live, and I'm thankful to live in Adairsville, Georgia. Amen. You know, if you think about that, you really realize what a blessing it is that we live where we live. Just as an exercise along that line, imagine uh, this question. Would you want to live uh, maybe in inner city Chicago? Well, I wouldn't want to live there, would you? <laughs> I wouldn't want to live out west in Los Angeles with that sprawling metropolis and a lot of weirdos out there. I wouldn't want to live back there. <laughs> I wouldn't want to live in New York City. That's just not my style. There's a lot of people there, and maybe they're as happy as clams up there where they're at. That's fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to live there. You know, any of those places would be better than some places on earth to live, though, wouldn't it? <clears throat> I tell you what, I certainly wouldn't want to live in communist China. I'm thankful for the freedoms that we have here, the liberties that we enjoy and the rights that we have. I wouldn't want to live in a godless and corrupt society like Russia, where for years the state has been held up as sort of the object of religious uh, fervor instead of God. I wouldn't want to live in a place like that. I wouldn't want to live down in uh, Central America, South America, where these uh, uh, vicious drug cartels run the show and keep everybody right under their thumb. I wouldn't want to live in a place like that. I'm thankful to live where I live. You know, here in this country, that means that we have inherent rights recognized by our government through our Constitution. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the freedoms and the liberties which we enjoy uh, being, being citizens here in the United States. But, you know, that only applies to our earthly citizenship. Where we live spiritually is a whole different ballgame. I want to spend a little time this morning talking about what it means to abide in Christ. Because that's really where we live as Christians. We live in Christ. We live in his church. We abide in him. And because of that, that has an important impact, not only on the here and now, but on eternity. And I'm thankful that that is the case. And so, just a few minutes, I want to talk basically about two points. One long one and one short one. And the long one is reflecting on what that means for us to abide in Christ. And then number two, very briefly at the end, I want to talk about how to get to that place where we can abide in Christ. In the first place, I want you to notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17, that when we abide in Christ or live in Christ, then we are new creatures. Here the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Do you remember that wonderful feeling that you had when you obeyed the gospel? When you came up out of that watery grave of baptism, maybe it was in a building. It could have been in front of a crowd like this in a baptistry. Maybe this one or one similar to it. Or it could have been... Like me, I, my baptism was outdoors in a, in a creek in the middle of the night. There were only two people there as witnesses. One of them was Mary, the other was the fellow who baptized me. But the feeling that you have when you come up out of that water, knowing that your sins have been washed away by the blood of Christ. Amen. It's not any kind of special power in that water. The power is in the blood of Christ mixed with our faithful obedience to God's plan. And oh, what a feeling it is when we come up out of that watery grave. You know, the, the entire purpose of baptism is really 
as an illustration of Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. Jesus died on the cross, and then they put him in a tomb, but he didn't stay there. On the third day, he rose from the dead. And so our baptism involves dying to sin, going under the water as a burial, and then, most importantly, rising to walk in a new life. I don't mean that in the sense that we are actually a different person. I was Rick Lawson before I went down under that creek. But when I came up, now I've been added to the church by the Lord. Where before I was lost, now I'm saved. Where before I was dedicated to living what life the way I wanted to live and dedicated my life to, to fun and pleasure or whatever it is, when I came up, I had a different goal in life. Now I'm striving to live faithfully. You know, that's a great responsibility, but it's also a great blessing to have a new start in life, isn't it? We all make mistakes. We need to put those behind us. What better way to do that than to have a whole new life, spiritually speaking? That's what we have when we abide in Christ. We are new creatures. We get a second chance. How are we going to use that? Next, the Bible teaches that when we abide in Christ as Christians through obedience to the gospel, when we abide in Christ, then we'll walk in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 6, the Bible says... As ye have therefore received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk ye in him. You know, one of the things that you notice when you study through the New Testament is this idea of walking means living. When we are walking in Christ, that means we're living for Christ. We're living the way he wants us to live, not the way the devil wants us to live, not the way the world says is right. We're living a different way, a better way. Now we're living Christ's way. And that shows up in our lives, doesn't it? That's how we stay close to Christ. By living for Him. That's how we hang on to Him. How we know that we have Christ. Because our lives bear that out. 2 John verse 9 says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. You know, I might say about that verse that you can't abide in Christ without abiding in Christ's doctrine. Jesus teaches some things. And in order to be in Christ, in order to be with Christ, you've got to hold to those teachings. Nobody would say about their political leanings, well, I'm a communist, but I don't believe in centralized government. I'm a socialist, but I believe in uh, very strict property rights. <laughs> See, you have to agree with what you are to be that thing. And we have to agree with Christ and his doctrine in order to be in him. So we, we are new creatures and we walk in Christ if we abide in him. Next, we are in his body if we abide in him. What is the body? Well, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 22, And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so, when we are in Christ, then we are in his body. We are part of the church, which is his body. You can't have Christ without the church, just like you can't have Christ without his doctrine. The church is the body of Christ. And you say, well, how important is that? Well, let me ask you this. How important is your body to you? <laughs> You know, here in this life, our souls and our bodies are bound together. And a large part of who I am right here and now is my physical body. And so I need to take care of it. 
If I get sick, I go to the doctor. If I need some medicine, I go to the pharmacy. If I'm hungry, I eat. If I'm tired, I rest. You see, these are things we do to take care of the physical body because it is who we are here in this life. And so if we're in Christ, then we're part of his body, which is the church. There's no separating Christ and his body. I'm thankful that I can be part of the body of Christ. We're either in the body or we're not. We're either in Christ or we're not. There is no, there is no third place to be. It's either inside or outside. And so we need to make sure that we are in Christ, in his body. In a similar fashion, just as we're in the body, we're also in the kingdom. The kingdom and the body are one and the same. Colossians 1 and verse number 13. The Bible says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. You see, the kingdom is not something way out in the future that's going to come into existence one day. The kingdom is already here. That's why the Apostle Paul writes here in Colossians chapter 3 that we, that is Christians, those, that's who he was writing to, the church at Colossae, he says we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Now how could Paul know that all those people that he was writing to had been translated into the kingdom? Because he was writing to members of the church. Members who were part of the body. If you're part of the body, then you're part of the kingdom. Remember, I already talked about being added to the church by the Lord when we obey the gospel. And so that means that we are in the kingdom. If we're in the church, then we're in the kingdom because they are one and the same. You know, just another quick illustration of that. While Jesus was still here on the earth... He told his apostles, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. You know what you do with keys, right? You unlock something so you can open it. And Peter and the rest of the apostles used the keys of the kingdom on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. When for the very first time they preached the gospel plan of salvation. We know that they did that because the Jews that were being preached to there on that occasion in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter and the rest of the apostles said in verse 38, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And so they used the keys of the kingdom, and what happened? They started adding people to the church. The Lord started adding people to the church daily, such as we're being saved. Acts chapter 2, verse number 47. And so, when we abide in Christ, we abide in his body. When we abide in his body, we're in the church. When we're in the church, we're in the kingdom. Next, when we abide in Christ, we are in his family. You know, one of the wonderful things about the church that Jesus built is the fact that we are all spiritual family and we are a part of it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 17, Romans 8 and verse number 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs together with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And so... Through obedience to the gospel, then, we become children of God. We become joint heirs with Christ. That means we're all part of the same family, God's family. And what a wonderful feeling that is to know that you have brothers and sisters around you who will help you, encourage you, keep you from falling when you stumble. Amen. And when you do stumble and fall, they'll come to you and help you get up again and, uh, and get back on the right track. What a great blessing that is. To know that we have family. You know, sometimes, though, it seems like we don't fight with anybody the way we fight with family. That's a shame, isn't it? We need to treat one another with love and kindness and courtesy because we're part of this great spiritual family in Christ. 
As part of that family, we have unity. That's part of abiding in Christ too. John chapter 17 is a prayer that Jesus prayed to God, the Father, before his agony on the cross, before his arrest and his kangaroo court trial and then the, the scourging and finally going to the cross to die. In John chapter 17, he prayed a prayer. And in that prayer, he thought about us. He started out that prayer by praying for the disciples that were there with him, his, his inner circle. But down in verse number 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone. In other words, not just the people right there around that uh, particular time, that particular place. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now that's us, isn't it? We believe because of what the apostles taught and preached and because of the, the gospel that they spread that came on down to us today. What is Jesus praying for us? That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so he prays for unity of the body, as they are in Christ and God. You see, when we abide in Christ, we're also abiding in God, then we have that unity that the body of Christ is supposed to have. Just like, just like the physical body has to have unity. Some of the most terrible diseases that men face is when their body turns on itself. That could happen in the spiritual body, too, if we're not careful. We've got to love one another, treat one another right, and realize that we are united in Christ because we're all part of that same body. Keeping that unity as it's supposed to be takes a lot of effort, though. That's why the Bible says in places like Ephesians chapter 4, and verse number 3. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That word there, endeavoring, in the original language means to make effort. To labor. Or to do something with speed. In other words, the things that you do that are important... Sometimes you can do in a hurry. We need to be anxious to work to keep the unity in the body of Christ that we, that we should have when we're abiding in Christ. If we drop our guard and let the devil get a toehold, he'll cause division. He'll cause problems in the body if he can. Unity is something that should be so precious to us. We work together in Christ to maintain that unity that we have in the church. Also, when we abide in Christ, the Bible teaches that the opposite is also true. That Christ abides in us. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He writes this and he, he's very personal in this note. You know, his, his messages aren't always like that. He, he rarely likes to really to write about himself. He deals with problems or gives instruction from God. But here he sort of turns the, the spotlight on himself briefly. And in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Isn't that an interesting thought? He says, I died with Jesus on the cross. But he says, I'm really not dead. Not the way Jesus died on the cross. I'm still living. But mentally and spiritually, emotionally, what Jesus did on the cross made that much of an impact in his life. He didn't know it when it happened. He rejected Christianity when he first learned about it. He tried to destroy Christians. 
But when he obeyed the gospel, he looked at the cross and saw that it was something earth-shaking that happened there. It was something that changed everything. Even if he didn't realize it at the time. I, he said, am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Why was that true of Paul? It was true of Paul because he obeyed the gospel and became a New Testament Christian. You see, when we abide in Christ, then he abides in us. Paul goes on to write there, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Doesn't that tie in so beautifully with what Terry read to us earlier from John 3.16? Jesus gave himself. He gave himself for us. Every one of us. Collectively, but individually too. Paul says, he gave himself for me. When I look back to the cross, I ought to see myself hanging there. Because Jesus took my place. Just like he took yours. Paul says, when you abide in Christ, then he abides in you. As Christians, we need to appreciate the fact that Christ lives in us. Amen. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1. The Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation... To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What a great blessing of being in Christ. The Bible tells us here that when we're in Christ, when we're abiding in Him, when He is our dwelling place, then there is no condemnation for us. What does that mean? It simply means this. We've been forgiven. God doesn't condemn us. He forgives us. What a great blessing that is. When we abide in Christ, there is no condemnation. Amen. You know, all these things are wonderful points. But I don't think they would do any good unless we know how to get into Christ. We've got to get into Christ before we can abide in Him. The Bible tells us how to do that in Galatians chapter 3. Beginning in verse number 26. The Bible says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Remember here, he's writing the book of Galatians to Christians. And he reminds them about who they are. He says, You are all the children of God. Well, how does that happen? By faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ. So critical, so important. But he hasn't yet reminded them of how, about how they got into Christ. He just reminds them that they are in Christ. It's verse 27 where he tells them how they got into Christ. He reminds them, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We are in this building this morning. Unless you're watching on the stream or listening in the parking lot. Those of us here are in the building. How did you get into this building? There's a difference between being in something and getting into something. We are in the building, but as far as I know, every one of us today got into this building by coming through the door. Maybe it was the door in the front. Maybe it was the door on the side. I suppose nobody jumped through the window. We all came in through the door. The Bible says that the door into Christ is baptism. As many of us as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Have you been baptized into Christ? Because if not, you can't abide 
in him. And none of the things that we've talked about here apply to you yet. But if you'll be baptized into Christ, if you'll abide in him, if you'll remain faithful in all these things that we've talked about here, they can show up in your life. They can be what you are. And you can have the blessings that are promised to all who abide in Christ. If we can help you obey the gospel today, we want to. That means following a plan that is 2,000 years old. You know, sometimes people are surprised when we tell them, people outside the church, when we study with them and we say to them, oh, we're not trying to get you to be part of our denomination. The Church of Christ is not a denomination. We don't believe in denominationalism. We believe in going back to the source. And so we teach the same plan that was taught in the New Testament, nothing more, nothing less. We don't add to it. We don't take away from it. That means hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Believing in Jesus as the Son of God, John 3, 16. Having enough faith to repent of your sins, Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. Coming forward to confess the name of Christ before men, just like the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, and verse 37. And then being immersed in water for the remission of your sins. To get into Christ into the body, into the church, into the kingdom, so that you can abide right there for the rest of your life. And then when this life is over and the judgment is passed, go on to be with God in heaven forever. If you're here as a Christian, you realize you haven't been doing what the Lord wants you to do, repent and pray that he'll restore you. He will. He'll forgive you of your sins and put you right back into the place you were before. And if we can help you publicly along that line, we're willing to pray with you and for you so that you can be restored. If you have a need, let us know right now as together we stand and as we sing. Oh,
Dear Father, we again thank you so very much for the opportunity we have to be here as your son's body, the church, the kingdom, to worship you, to fellowship with one another. Well, thank, we're thankful for your son's sacrifice that we do have the hope of eternal life in heaven with you if we will be obedient to your word, if we'll do the things that you have commanded to be saved from our sins. Father, we're so thankful that you have given us your word so that we do have this hope. Father, as we go out this afternoon, we ask that you would keep us safe and bring each and every one of us back this evening. Help us, Father, to never neglect to be here to attend. Help us to have the deep understanding in our minds of how important it is to be here every opportunity we have. That we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but that we should be eager to gather and help us, Father, to be here every single chance we have. All those who are mentioned who are, who are sick, who are approaching surgeries and different procedures and who are recovering from those, we ask that you would be with all of them and help them. Father, as we celebrate those graduating tonight, we ask that you would help us to impart all the wisdom we can from your word. We ask that you would help them and protect them as they enter into this new part of their lives. Father, we ask again that you would protect us today and bring us back again at the next point of time. We thank you for everything, most of all for your son and his sacrifice. It's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.